All right, hello, hello, welcome everybody. Um, we'll give people just a minute to come in. Happy Wednesday, hope you're all having a great week so far. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Megan Sobel, I'm the marketing director here at FounderMade. And at FounderMade, our mission is to provide founders, entrepreneurs, and consumer brands a community platform and the tools they need to really propel their businesses to the next level. Um, and this Power Hour series is designed to give you the chance to really deep dive into the winning strategies and get expert insights that you can apply directly to your business as you build. So be sure to introduce yourself in the chat today. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're building. And you can also use that chat and Q&A box to submit questions for our speakers today. And today's Power Hour is presented by Airhouse, the first all-in-one logistics platform for modern direct-to-consumer e-commerce companies. We'll be discussing all the things you need to know as you launch and grow your D2C brand from ideation to massively scaling. And uh, today you'll be getting different perspectives from the founders of some amazing brands who all had different paths to where they're at now. So be sure to jump in the chat and ask them questions about whatever you'd like to learn from them. Um, and with that, I'd like to pass it over to Sarah Siwak, the co-founder of Airhouse. Sarah, I'll let you take it away, tell our audience a little bit about yourself, about Airhouse, um, and of course, about the conversation we'll be leading today. Totally, thanks, Megan, excited to be here. Um, so to tell you folks a little bit about Airhouse, I'm one of the co-founders, um, essentially we started Airhouse to help direct consumer companies, high growth companies with all of their operations. So we help folks with both D2C and B2B orders, anyone who's sort of making manufacturing a product. We work with companies like Siblings, Bask and Burn um, and many others to help them get their orders from point A to point B. So little bit about our service. We handle sort of all-in-one pick pack storage, all of the services on the warehouse front. We manage a unique warehouse network um, that has a variety of different capabilities. And then we also give folks visibility into their inventory, their orders through a dashboard. So we also build technology to integrate into your store. Um, and what makes us unique is we're designed exclusively to work with modern high growth companies on like a lot of different uh, fulfillment solutions. So with that, I will kick it off and um, would love to hear Johnny, Mike, and David about sort of your name, your company, what you sell, um, and also the story of your company. So what's your background? What made you start this company in particular? So Johnny, if you want to start. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah, for having me. And um, thank you um, to everyone that, that's viewing. I appreciate it um, here at Founder Made. Yeah. My, my name is Johnny Adamick. My background is in public health. I'm a former public health official for in New York city. Um, I specialized in what's called built environment and to prevent the spread of, um, basically non-communicable diseases. So the opposite of SARS COVID is basically things like type two diabetes or obesity related chronic diseases. Um, worked on Mayor Bloomberg's obesity task force, really interesting background that, parlayed into what I do now, uh, co-founded Burn, been doing this for about seven years with my business partner, Jimmy T. Martin, who's a multi-hyphenate background is in improv comedy. He was on SNL's JV squad, really, really great guy. And we are here now as a D2C uh, company. We have an online fitness uh, product. We're an online fitness company that has a product. Our signature product is now, it's called the Burn Board. Um, and it's a slide board, it's six, six feet wide, it adjusts to five feet, remember Apollo Ono, um, sliding back in the day, sliding west to east laterally. Um, that's the marquee product and we have an online fitness subscription of, of hundreds of videos at 10, 20, 30, 45 and 60 minutes. That's what we're doing now. We were uh, originally a brick and mortar fitness uh, concept in New York City um, that exercised people in a giant fridge set to 50 degrees. So we're the world's first cool temperature fitness experience. The pandemic happened. We launched in 2018. Um, we were future proofing the brand already, getting into homes, working on this, this connected smart slide board. Pandemic happened. We put kerosene on the fire. And alas, here we are. I think I'm keeping it to under three minutes working with Sarah now on selling this burn board across the US. So I'll pause there. Thank you. Awesome. David, do you want to share your background and story? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, thank you, Sarah. And uh, thanks to everyone who is tuning in today to hear a little about 
all of us, but uh, I'm Dave Bronke, co-founder of Siblings, uh, which is a home essentials brand tackling throwaway culture through sustainable goods. Our first product is a clean candle, which is a premium candle in a plant-based compostable bag. And that bag contains everything needed to make a new candle out of an empty candle jar, an old mug, or a quirky teacup. And the idea is to really encourage people to reuse what they already have and to think about buying for the long term. Now, I got into this because uh, my previous background was actually co-founding an outdoor accessories brand that's distributed worldwide in places that you might find it like REI and Zoomies. And over the last decade, I spent a ton of time traveling through Asia, just going from factory to factory. And I got a really close firsthand look at what uh, kind of our consumerism culture was doing from fast fashion to excessive packaging. Um, it all just didn't feel good. And my company was part of that problem. So my sister, um, who's also my co-founder, uh, was having similar feelings in her world. So we came together to create siblings. And we started with candles just because um, it's something that you don't think about as being a wasteful industry, but once you dive into it, it really is. Uh, from the glass jars that don't get reused or recycled to toxic paraffin wax, it's just a byproduct of the petroleum industry and no one should be burning in their home, uh, to artificial scents that lead to headaches and migraines. Um, we really saw an opportunity to create candles that are clean on multiple fronts. So we use a natural coconut blend wax, we use non-toxic fragrance and essential oils, and our bags are plant-based and compostable. So we're really encouraging people, like I said, to just reuse existing vessels and to make new candles out of the ones that they already own. Um, and right now we're uh, DDC uh, launched in late 2019, but we're slowly starting to move out of DDC into some partnerships. Um, and it's been an amazing journey to, to date. And we're just getting a great response from people who are looking for this thing and have their drawers filled with candles that they weren't quite sure what to, to do with before. Awesome. And Mike, and I'm gonna post in the chat if I can, um, the links basically to everyone's websites just so you can check out the products. But Mike, would love to hear your story. Yeah, I'm Mike Huff Settler. I'm the founder and CEO of Basque Sun Care. Um, yeah, interestingly, I have absolutely zero experience in personal care or sunscreen coming into this, um, which by the way, I think is a lesson for anybody who's thinking about starting something like it actually can be really beneficial to have an outsider's perspective on it. Um, but I have worked in startups. I've been on growth teams. Um, but the reason that I started Basque and, and what Basque is doing, we're a clean ingredient sunscreen um, that's trying to make uh, sun care fun and enjoyable. Um, I started this because I have skin cancer in my family. Um, and I actually started a nonprofit first. And the whole idea was this is the number one most diagnosed cancer in the country, more than all other cancers combined, despite the fact that it's the most preventable objectively, just wear more sunscreen and your chances of contracting skin cancer drop by 80%. Um, and in doing that, the idea for the nonprofit was let's just give away sunscreen for free. I went to go find a, a partner, a sunscreen partner to work with. I'm walking through the aisle of a CVS in Bethany beach, Delaware one day. And it like, like cartoon light bulb went off in my head, like, holy crap, sunscreen sucks. And this is an archetypal D to C category. The, they use really bad ingredients, stodgy commoditized brands. Why can't I build a clean ingredient sunscreen that's wrapped in a beautiful brand that appeals to millennials and Gen Zs um, and really focus on, on changing the way that people talk about sunscreen? No longer is it a chore that your mother made you do when you were a kid, but it's something that you actually want to do, something that's fun, and the bottle is almost an accessory uh, for your beach bag. Um, so that was uh, the, the genesis of it. So I kind of stumbled into it. Uh, we launched uh, early this summer. We've been live for a, a little less than 80 days now and, and things are going great. Fantastic. And so to talk a little bit about launching and growing, um, this question's for all three of you. Um, so all of you guys sell at least partially direct to consumer. I know that your strategies vary a little bit. Um, so my question for all of you is, why did you decide to sell direct to consumer and where do other channels factor into your strategy? So for example, things like working with retailers, selling on marketplaces like Amazon. 
Um, so there's this common direct consumer playbook that everyone loves to talk about that says basically like only sell online all the time, ignore other channels until later in your company's life cycle. And I think depending on the product that might apply, that might not apply. Um, and so the reason for that is essentially to gather data to stay close to your customer. Um, but I, I know that just from talking to folks, it's getting expensive to advertise, it's getting a little bit more complex to sell D2C. Um, and new D2C brands are very abundant, so it's a bit competitive. So there are more options than ever. Um, so I'm curious to know if that playbook that's sort of pioneered by early brands like Casper, or like Bonobos, is it still useful? Does it still apply to your product category? Um, a few of you hinted at it. And, and or does your strategy look different either now or in the future for you know selling D2C, timing B2B, other sales channels? How did you guys determine how to sell and where to sell? Um, so starting with... Johnny, let me do the round robin again. Love it, love it, man. I could talk for hours. I think about this. Um, to, to answer your, your first question was, how did we decide? Why did why did we decide? We had no choice. We were mandated closed by the state of New York, the city of New York, you know, fitness studio um, through 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 the duration of the pandemic, and we you know we call it a hard pivot. And that's essentially what happened. So we threw kerosene on, on this fire, you know, concomitant to exercising people in this giant custom beer fridge set to 50 degrees. Our top grossing class was this slide board class. So we knew we needed to go all in. The cool thing was, was that we, you know, we had tested it. We, had, you know, people loved the product. We used it. You know, 23,000 people have been through our studio for close to 20 months. So it was, you know, tried to, tried and tested, um, didn't have to replace a single board. So now it was giddy up. How do we right, expand this? And so the first person we called was Airhouse. And the second person we called was a contact of mine to set up our, our operations to, to make, these, make these boards at mass. Um, so yeah, I think that that's kind of the, the first question is we had to be forced, we were forced into it. Um, you know, for, for the sake of and health of our business. And now we sell, we set up on Shopify. So we sell D2C through our own shop. We are set up on Amazon. We have an amazing store and um, have had tremendous success. We've seen 400% growth on Amazon since May, essentially. And then now we're working on getting into big wholesale channels, um, specialty retail shops. But, you know, ex you know big, major, major, um, you know, point of sale brick and mortar um, outfits here in the States. And it's really exciting. But to get to that point, we had to, you know, test proof the product we had, we have to get reviews on it. We have to, you know, be in the public eye. So it's, it's a, the sum of the parts is what is going to be a, it's what's going to help us be successful. And obviously relying on Airhouse to make sure the product gets to the customer in good standing on time. Um, and it's, it's been, it's been a delight. Awesome. And David, same question for you there. Yeah, it, it is definitely a great question. Um, so for myself, I, I spent a ton of time in the wholesale world. And while there are amazing partners, it just takes a ton of resources and infrastructure. And there's always lots of hurdles to make sure that wholesale is successful. So when I launched Siblings, it was definitely about DTC first. It was like, hey, we've got a really new concept here with candles in a bag that people are not quite familiar with. And the approach with DTC was that it's much faster. We're able to test, iterate on the product to figure out our messaging. Um, and that was really needed early on. But the long-term approach was never going to be like straight DTC. Um, it really was, it's candles. It needs to be in a store. It needs to be out there. People want to touch it, feel it, um, mostly smell it. Um, and we knew that. So we had plans to very early on try to get in some in real life kind of pop-up style, get something where people could interact with their product. And we had a few of those going in early 2020, but those got canceled uh, and we were just forced to, to stay in the DTC kind of lane for a little bit. Um, and it really has helped a lot in terms of just making sure that we understood our customer, our messaging, what we were putting out there, how people were um, interacting with it and made us get kind of better with it uh, just because candles is a tough thing to try to describe online when people really just want to smell it. Um, but now that things have started to open back up again, we've got a lot of great partnerships coming. Uh, so for us, the brand's always been about making sure that we find that balance and uh, really looking forward to the future where there's definitely going to be this kind of shared interaction between DTC and the offline approach. Beautiful. 
And Mike, how about yourself splitting D to C, B to B, other sales channels? How are you guys thinking about that? Yeah. So for us, the, the first thing that we did was we looked at our competitive landscape and we try to be contrarians um, and, and think about if, if sunscreen companies are zigging, then we're going to zag. And almost 99% of distribution of sunscreen is brick and mortar. So we just saw D to C as an opportunity in, in, in a, a wide open lane. I and mean, if you think of the biggest brand in sunscreen, it's Coppertone. You literally cannot buy Coppertone from their website. Um, so we saw it as, as an opportunity to become the D to C brand. I don't know how many verticals that, that, um, exists in anymore, that type of an opportunity. Um, but there were a lot of other reasons to go D to C for us as well. Um, you know, we, we do want to ultimately, uh, go omni channel. Um, and we just felt like out of the gate being D to C and creating a connections with our customers, um, but B also really owning that brand equity and really building up and, and being responsible for it was going to position us much better down the road. Um, once we started to have conversations with, you know, big retailers. Um, and I think kind of proof of, of, of the, the strategy there, we thought that those conversations would start happening a year or two down the road. Um, but they started happening really, really quickly. Um, it, it, by virtue of how we launched direct to consumer, we got a lot of really, really interesting inbound uh, requests from some really large retailers. Um, and I don't think that that happens if we go live in one store, we have, um, you know, a, a brick and mortar strategy out the gate. And I think D2C was really, you know, the thing that fueled that. Awesome. I think a related question I was going to ask later, but might make sense now um, for all three of you, what data is most important when you're figuring out where to sell, when you're figuring out how to develop your product, whether it's qualitative data, quantitative data, just what do you want to know um, about your customer or your industry or anything like that to basically feed back into product development sales? So what metrics do you track and live by or what information is most important for, for you as you grow your company? I'll start with Johnny. Yeah, for us, we were really lucky because we had a living, breathing, physical location that allowed us to, to innovate and interact uh, with our community. And, and you know, our, you know, it's really important. We've always been innovators and our mission is has always been to inspire what we say betterment to everybody, um, including everybody from the BIPOC community, from all sorts of walks of life. Um, we want to be representative and to them, but but also do so in, in an affordable and innovative way. And so in New York City on 20th and 6th, we got to do that for 20 months. And so we were there, we research monkeyed, um, survey polled our community. And once the pandemic happened, you know, we we knew had we'd been through our doors, 23,000 people. And so on the marketing side, it was great. We got we ran a nationwide lookalike audience on that. And you know, and then also in terms of the qualitative, it just kind of made sense, you know, where the orders were going, you know, LA, New York City, but we saw blips and pockets and parts like Dallas or up in Western part of Oregon, really interesting to understand. And, you know, pivoting from a brick and mortar to D to C, it was, it was tremendously tough. Um, we had to let go of 23 people, the hardest calls I've ever had to make in, in my entire life. Um, but in order to survive as a business, we needed we needed to move on. And so that meant that Jimmy and I had to roll up our sleeves and we made a lot of calls to customers to talk to them about the board. And fun fact, our initial hundred boards that we made didn't have a handle in them. And that, you know, aesthetically kind of an interior design aficionado, I thought the handle would would make the board not look as cool. Function trumped that. So everyone's like, you gotta have a handle on this. So we put a handle in it and just something clicked so that's 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 our that's where we are right now but definitely getting other other sorts of what i'll call biomarkers awesome how about you david yeah i think it's so easy to kind of feel data overload these days and to want to look at every single metric and just be like where's this customer from you know just every detail but uh, I think pulling back and you really look at some of the biggest companies in the world, they try to hone in on one metric and let that be the North Star for driving decisions. 
Um, I, I do believe that in the early days, you're not going to know that right away. And it's okay to kind of try to figure out what that North Star is going to be. Um, that's really going to help drive the growth. So I'll just, you know, instead of going into all of them, like siblings, we, we really are attuned to our conversion rate because I think it's where a lot of questions can start from. And if it's high, it's why. It's like, where are those customers? Let's find more of those. If it's low, it's always about we're doing something wrong and you can kind of start to spider web out from there. Uh, so that's a huge one for us that we really try to stay uh, on top of. Um, but I think for future growth and as we start to um, get a little bit bigger, it's really been about total subscribers um, because that one is something that it's going to fuel the future. It's not just about fueling today or tomorrow. Uh, so in that, again, it's always just coming back to like you figure out the why and uh, let it spiderweb out from there and um, try to keep it simple. Like don't try to look at 15 different metrics because you can get lost in all that stuff. At least for us, that's been really helpful is to try to just hone in on a few that we know we need to improve because it'll help across the board. Awesome. And Mike? Yeah, I'll, I'll echo something that Johnny said, which is, um, and I think one of the great advantages of D2C versus other models out there is this connection to your customers. Um, so, you know, constantly be in conversation with them. It's not one way, it's got to be two way. And they're going to tell you incredible things. And, you know, examples of that, like specific feedback that we've gotten is, is literally informing our very next product launches. Um, but uh, more specifically around data, um, when we were launching, the very first thing that we did, and we're very mission focused around this idea of preventing skin cancer. Um, the very first thing that we want to do is understand why people don't wear sunscreen. Um, and we talked to 50,000 people. I personally spoke to 500 people over Zoom and telephone calls, and I wanted to understand what are those barriers. Um, and to give you an example, we, we kind of identified four, the top four, but far and away, number one was people hated how sunscreen felt on their skin. So then we became maniacally focused on creating a sunscreen that feels amazing on your skin, something that you would want to reapply. Um, and then, you know, after launch, as we've, you know, shifted to operating, um, I'm really concerned about three primary metrics, but they are, I think the, the output of these three um, is revenue and, and we want to be a growth story. So revenue is, is really important, but it's, it's customers, AOV, and frequency. Um, and so I think about if I want to double the business, um, what can I do? That sounds pretty daunting. But if you just grow those three metrics, customers, frequency, and AOV by 33%, and you can double your business that way. And so we're constantly playing around with different things that we can do to juice one of those metrics. And to give you an example, live on our site right now, we've got free shipping if you spend $70 or more. And that was because we were seeing an AOV that was at about 65 and we wanted to see if it would go up. And that experiment's been live for about three weeks and it's been working. Um, and so those are the, the types of things that we're doing focused on those specific metrics. Awesome. And so we got a question, I think that's somewhat related. Um, what's the best way to get your brand out there? So was it ads, focus groups, et cetera? And I think Mike and Johnny, you answered this a little bit, Johnny leveraging, you know, whether it's partnerships or previous audience, and then Mike, I'm hearing focus groups and just really in-depth customer research. So maybe I'll add, ask that question for David um, and, and, and if either of you or any of you have anything to add to that, um, just in terms of broad general brand awareness. Um, maybe starting out what worked well, just to start. Yeah, what worked for us, I mean, for siblings, I think looking back, it, it'd be someone to really help um, if we had a little bit more of that pre-launch hype or anything like that. But we really looked at siblings as a, as a story-based brand. We wanted to get the story out there. What were we trying to accomplish? That there's obviously an issue with candles and, and the industry as a whole, and we're trying to do something about it. We have a strong mission. Uh, so for us, we really went more of the, the press, the media route. We tried to get our story out there as much as possible. And we thought that would be the best way to reach as many customers and uh, hopefully drive traffic to the website as opposed to spending, spending, spending on ads um, before we actually really knew how the interaction would happen. And that proved to be, uh, it proved to be successful for us. 
it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for everyone. Um, and if you have the money and you have the strategy, I'm sure ads could do something similar, but we really wanted to just work on getting the story out there first. And that meant working through a lot of the you know, word of mouth, organic means, and uh, the press and media mentions, as well as some influencers to try to just get our story out there and um, see how people then interacted with the, the messaging that we were providing. And, and that was the most successful for us. Awesome. So I have three questions now in turn, um, turning away from growth and talking a little bit more about maybe the product side, the logistics side. Um, so this first question is for Mike. So if, you know, if you were just sort of lay it out, what were the key steps that were sort of involved before you began selling and shipping orders? And how long, I think, did it take for you to find manufacturers, make your idea a reality there? Yeah. Um, so the, the very first step um, was that process I described of talking to 50,000 people. And that was a combination of surveys and um, and, and interviews and, and things like that, but it's very like lean startup methodology. So there's like literally a textbook written on how to do this. Um, but that was, that was a three month process that felt like writing a college thesis, but I think it was fundamentally important. It, it, it has informed everything that we do from how we created our product to how we distribute it to the things that we focus on. I think it's really important to know who you are and that is, is foundational. So I would say like put the work in um, at the early, early stages, pre-pre-product to understand who your customer is, why you're, how you should design your product, why that's important to them. How does that bridge the gap for them between, you know, where they are now and where they want to be as a person? Um, that is, is really important work. And then from there, it was like, you know, how do I, I guess, how do I make this thing, which is, is tough for someone who's never worked in personal care before. Um, this was, this is going to vary sector to sector, but um, basically there's 25 contract manufacturers to make all the sunscreen for everybody, no matter how big they are. Um, and the really, really tough thing was that their MOQs or minimum order quantities and their R&D fees on every single SKU were astronomical. And I almost gave up because I was like, this is going to be way too much money for me to get out the gate without anything left to, to market the product that I just made. Um, but I just called every single person that I could and through a friend of a friend, I met someone we were able to, I was able to convince them to do a deal with me and they're phenomenal uh, manufacturing partner. Um, so I guess the lesson there is don't give up. And then just the final thing is I think right now it's, you know, easier than it's ever been to start a direct to consumer company. Um, and I'm not being like paid to say this or anything, but the number one thing that I hear from other found founders, that's the biggest pain is that they hate their 3PL. Um, and that was kind of like the last step to this like very seamless ability to start um, a D2C company was this, this seamless distribution and, and Airhouse has really solved that problem for us. Um, and, and so we've got a pretty like out of the box stack and, and Airhouse is this really important piece of it. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> sure. um... And then Johnny, I think, and then David, I have a question for you as well on the logistics front, but Johnny, um, let's talk about manufacturers. So tell me about the challenges you encounter sort of before it hits the warehouse, creating the product, importing the product, all that good stuff. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, I am just, I mean, I had to move to Minneapolis for this and I locked myself in my brother-in-law's childhood bedroom and Jimmy stayed in New York city and tackled a whole other aspect of the business. Um, just on on filming content and video for our online subscription. So back in operations, you know, sc scrappy startup founder. You know, I'm a trained bureaucrat, so yeah, I can I can just multitask and good with with you know red tape and whatnot. And the first thing I did was I pulled uh, you know picked up the phone and I called a friend of mine who introduced me to his uncle. And this is what his uncle did. And to set up manufacturing, that, that's the smartest thing I've ever done was to surround, you know, Jimmy and I with, and he's done the same as well, with people that are smarter than ourselves. And so there's no way I would have been able to do this. No way. 
And was, we're talking, call him Uncle Jim, you know, 20 plus years of industry um, um, experience. And he's been manufacturing with this group in, in Asia for decades. And so we had to first try, we first wanted to try to make it in the States for, for many reasons. Um, we wanted to see if we could get the cost down. But you know, our wood bumpers were made in Wisconsin. The red, it's a recycled resin was, and still recycled in Asia, was made in Ohio, but driven to Pennsylvania. And we just couldn't get it, get it down and under budget. So we flew boards over to Asia and they were able to, to replicate the boards to a T. It's actually even um, a, a better sliding surface. And I mean, go figure, having to do this in a pandemic, typically you're then in Asia as the product comes off the press to, to inspect, we didn't get to do that. So we did WeChat calls to, to verify it. And the funniest story is the first product came over, then official, like our official container came over, we blessed it, everything, 625 boards came. I ordered the first one. So Jim's super nervous because he's never done this before, not having been to Asia, open it up. And the board is absolutely picture perfect. The aspect we missed was like a car engine needs oil so that the engine can work. The burn boards um, use just basically an armor all spray, like an interior cleaning spray, like a pledge. And so we tried to duplicate the wipes, the wipes, the wipes didn't work. And so, you know what, I will take that problem because I know I can order armor all and work with our work with Airhouse to have every board custom picked and packed and, and thrown in there. And that's what we did. But it's, you know, it's perseverance, it's time, money, effort. It's a lot of mistakes, but it's just keep on keeping on and adapting and pivoting as needed. Right. So I'm hearing from both of you, just keep going, <laughs> keep trying this stuff. Um, stay flexible. And, and David, um, so I know you mentioned you had previously started another company, the sort of physical product company. So um, tell me a little bit about what was most complex to learn or navigate about logistics in general, whether with siblings or your previous company. Um, so the reason for this question is I think we meet a lot of people who have more of a tech background. And I think technology, we're starting D2C companies and technology works relatively seamlessly, you know what I mean? Like the errors are cheaper, you know, if something happens when you're setting up a website versus when something happens when you're importing a product. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, what was most complex or surprising about logistics? Yeah, I could go on for this question for the entire time period probably. And I just want to say what, what Mike and Johnny mentioned, uh, it, that's gold like it, it's so valuable um i'll start with a kind of a funny story though about my biggest lesson in the freight forwarding world which is uh early part of logistics and this was in the previous business where we're trying to save every penny possible wherever there's a, a place we can save or pinch we're doing it and we don't know how to do any of this stuff as well so one of the areas is how do you get your goods from asia to your final destination to your warehouse and we tried to save money by essentially just having it dropped off at the port of Oakland and we'll pick it up. So I show up at the largest warehouse in the Oakland port that I've ever seen in my entire life, uh, walk in and try to negotiate all the paperwork, which I didn't have on hand. So I'm going through emails and trying to show them that I need to get this stuff released. And then finally I do, and they say, all right, pull around out back to the loading bay. And I'm like, okay, I don't think this person knows it's just me and my Ford Explorer at this point. So of course I get back there and it's just nothing but semis in the loading bay trying to back up. And I'm literally trying to weave in and out of them to try to get up to the warehouse. And it's finally, I get up there and I, I give the guy the paperwork. He pulls the forklift around. He's like, what do you want me to do with this? Like he's about to forklift a pallet on top of my car. <laughs> and uh, everyone at this point is just watching me and like, what is this person doing? <laughs> Uh, so I spent the next hour dismantling the entire pallet and trying to pack in the car, jumping up and down from the loading bay. And it was, it was ridiculous. And, uh, I think it's just a big lesson in do the things you're good at. Don't try to save every penny here and there. Um, talk to people first about like what, don't just listen to be like, oh, I can save 300 bucks by not having this thing delivered to the final destination. Uh, so I think that was, that was a big, uh, learning experience for sure. And I've definitely never picked up a shipment of goods again at, at the port. Um, but it really comes back to another thing that I've, I've learned a ton of is just over communicate kind of where Johnny said, like, 
have every fail safe in mind when you're thinking through the final quality control checklist, because once that stuff leaves wherever it's being manufactured, it's so hard to fix. It's so hard to fix after that point. So whatever it takes, I mean, if it's just over communicating, it's more zooms, it's being able to look over the product, it's getting video cameras in that manufacturing place to make sure that it's done how you want it to, because the last thing you want to do is have it show up at air house and you have to fix it. That's a bigger mistake. And the last thing after that is if it leaves and the customer gets, it, it's even worse. So um, it's just a ton of fail safes, lots of over communication and making sure that your quality control is just dialed because the problems are easier to fix at the factory than they are anywhere else. Yeah, totally. That's one of my favorite stories now, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that that piece about over communicating and sort of understanding where different providers, regardless of sort of which logistics providers and fulfillment providers you're using line up and, and really just trying to get total transparency, like make no assumptions. It's been a, a huge learning, I think, in, in yeah. even just building a service that works for folks too on our end. Um, awesome. So one more question, David, I will actually ask you as well. Um, so this is a little bit more on the brand front. Um, so when we're selling direct to consumer and, and Mike, I might also ask this question to you as well. Um, means that your customers are mostly interacting with shipments, you know, so that's the physical place where they're, you know, touching your product, experiencing your brand. Um, so David, I know siblings has a pretty killer unboxing experience. How did you guys approach packaging and designing that experience? That's an, yeah, it's a great question. And it's something that we think about quite a bit. The customer experience with the final product is so important. And for me, I come from a background where it's all about great product besides anything else. Like if your product's not good, you got, you got nothing. It doesn't matter how great your marketing is, even this day and age. So i um, very focused on the final product. And I'm very fortunate that my co-founder is a user experience designer by trade. So it really helped that we both came together and was like, we need to make sure that the final experience is so easy and that people love the experience. It's something that they're not afraid of doing and they want to tell others about. Uh, and so for us with the process of creating a candle, we were like, it's got to be as easy as making a cup of coffee. And it's proved challenging because no one had really put a candle inside of a bag and then tried to make the kind of process something where you'd actually, if you're not familiar with siblings, you essentially get this bag and you place it in the microwave or you can melt it over the stovetop and you create a liquid wax and you can pour that into your candle vessel. So for us, we didn't want to have extra materials, extra steps. Um, so on the packaging standpoint, it was pretty challenging. We need to have it work with extreme temperatures, um, but also just very easy to pour. And we ended up finding um, a plant-based compostable bag that worked for all of our needs, um, but was still durable enough for the shipping and handling aspect. So it took quite a bit of um, kind of R&D to really find that packaging that worked. And then once we did, it was all about, okay, we've had we have the packaging, we've got the easy process. How do we help with them when they're making it? How do we make it something that they're going to, you know, have fun with? And that's where we went with kind of a little zine style, little brand booklet that comes along with every order. And it contains all the info needed to make the candle, but also a lot of background on the brand, general candle tips, all about our mission. Um, and it tends to be something where if people skip the directions on the back of the bag, they're always reading this little zine. And I think that's been a huge part of it. It's just like kind of having your personal brand ambassador there talking about the product as you create the candle. Um, and we get a ton of comments on just how many people enjoy the extra touch. So that's something that I think really helps is thinking through your product from all standpoints. Um, once they have it, once they've unboxed it, are they going to just dive right in? Or is there something extra you can do to make them feel good about what they've just purchased and the brand in general? Um, and that's what we've tried to do with, with siblings. Awesome. And then Mike, um, any learnings or lessons, I guess, on the packaging front? I, I know that you guys also sell merch, um, anything, and, it, and it's a very design forward brand. I think all three of you are. Um, anything in particular that would be useful for folks to know about packaging and, um, you know, just creating that experience? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> well, David really nailed it. Um, but I think you, you want to delight, you know, and I definitely wouldn't send anything out until you've experienced the unboxing yourself, but you want it to be a delightful experience. And there's actually some really cool videos that you can watch on YouTube, which are like, um, like box experts 
talking about the various features of these D2C brands as they unbox and show you why it's there. Um, it, the, the one thing that I'll add to what David said, though, is like you can delight and create this incredible and unique and beautiful brand moment without breaking the bank. Um, you know, you can be clever, you can be innovative and you can be scrappy. Um, and you don't have to have some like crazy Apple looking, uh, product packaging. Um, but you definitely want to aim to delight. That is the very first moment that you get to introduce your brand in person to that, to that customer. Uh, and you want to make sure that it's, it's a, it's a good feeling and a good experience. Awesome. And then we're coming up on time and we have a few questions I'd love to get to. And if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to dump them in the Q&A. But um, sort of to close, question for all three of you, um, and I'll sort of bundle a lot of questions together and can choose which one resonates the most with you. But um, what's the hardest thing right now about building an e-commerce company? And if you were to start another one, what would you do differently? Or what advice would you give folks who are just starting out? Johnny, if you want to. Sure. Yeah. I think right now it's the, it's, it's what we can't control. Um, you know, if I had it my way, I'd have, you know, 10,000 boards in stock and we'd be, and then be sitting in our house and we'd be ready to go. But right now that's, that's not, that's not the case with cash flow and inventory. So that's, you know, those are the two unnecessary evils. And then there's oh, this other marker of the Delta variant that was happening over in Asia. We were chit chatting before the call about this is, um, this happened um, in February of last year. They in, they did an, like immediate interprovince lockdown uh, in Asia, um, in, in in China specifically. So we had again we had bumpers that were getting delivered. These are recycled wood, by the way, that are getting delivered from one province, and they mandated the lockdown. And the truck driver had to quarantine for two weeks before I believe it was it was a mail could enter into then the city where we actually assembled the boards. So we literally and figuratively missed the February 22nd boat. And that delayed us like almost six weeks with us being able to get on the next boat. So we were able to capture pre-order sales, but I sure as heck wanted to get those customers, their boards in the three to five business days like we typically can. So, you know, thesis here is you can control what you can control and just do everything in your power to plan accordingly for the variables that you can't control. David. Yeah, I think uh, there's so many hard things, but I think one that uh, it's hard to almost wrap your head around is realizing you're competing with customers within every category on the internet these days. And yes, we're all trying to target specific customers, but so is every other brand and everyone's getting social ads. Everyone's getting multiple brand emails a day. So it can really feel daunting. And I think uh, it's something that you just have to almost push through the noise a little bit and say, okay, this is going to be a challenge. It's going to be fun. And you got to have a great mission, I think, um, and vision for your brand to help you through those days where you're just like, I'm trying to compete with everyone and they have more resources. They have more of this and that. And you can't look at it that way. You just have to say, Hey, I'm in my lane. I've got something great here. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, and it'll work. And I think that's something that uh, is pretty hard right now is just figuring out, okay, how do you actually compete with everyone else? And it's um, through your own creativity and it's through your, what you want to do with your brand. So just look at it that way and don't compare yourself to uh, what everyone else is doing. Just try to do something fun with what, what you have. And I think that's been um, something great with, uh, with siblings and it's hopefully we can continue that. I agree. Comparison is a really easy way to burn out <laughs> your public a company. So definitely. And Mike? Um, I have very quick ones on all three. Hardest, what would I do differently and some advice. Hardest thing, and I think it's especially for a, a solo founder, is just like the entrepreneurship game has a lot of highs and lows. And you can't get too high off the highs and you can't get too, off, too low off the lows. And you just got to keep chugging along and moving forward but don't let it eat at you and also don't think you're the king of the world because you had two really good sales days in a row because you know day three will hit you hard if it's not a good one um what would i do differently um throughout the entire like product development uh 
process, we were so diligent about testing, 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 and getting feedback. Then when we launched, we just went nuts and was like, like, you know, spray and pray with Facebook ads. I wish we had started much smaller and gotten some really, really good data and insights from testing small and then scaled up. Um, and so we basically like restarted that process. So I would just say like, make sure you're testing all of your ads and finding the right audiences and finding the right copy and finding the right creative before you start spending a bunch of money on Facebook ads, especially since it's really hard and really competitive right now. Um, and then the final thing, which is a piece of advice is know who you are. And I think that this uh, is a lesson for the entrepreneur, but it's also a lesson for your brand. You have to know who you are and like specific to the entrepreneur, know what you're good at. David said that earlier, focus on the things you're good at, understand what you're not good at and get help with those things. And from a brand perspective, you have to know who you, what your brand is, why it exists. And that helps you determine what to do, but also what not to do and how to talk and everything in between. So know who you are and do the work to understand that. Great advice. And I think it's also a good segue into one of the questions we had, and, and Megan, feel free to interrupt me if we're, we're coming up against time at any point, but um, question from a CPG company looking to launch a snack food with a direct-to-consumer focus. Um, on the talent front, what are some tips on finding a good D2C person to lead efforts? Um, I would also add in a secondary question where it's like, is that you or is that a consultant or how do you guys think about, um, I guess, yeah, leading efforts, it's a little broad in the question, but maybe the brand side, the fulfillment side, the operations side, just what do you look for in terms of um, folks that you work with or skill sets in general? I'll open that up to anybody. Um, uh, there's a lot of variables here, but you know, if you're trying to put one person into it and see what happens, then you need somebody who's a generalist I would say, who can see the, the big picture um, and somebody who has a pretty maniacal work ethic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think also, um, you know, surround yourselves again by people smarter than you. And then to get into the weeds, I mean, two years ago to today with marketing, even MailChimp to Klaviyo has changed just significantly. So, I mean, we have a a really, really great um, Clavio expert that um, she leads the data, runs it in accordance with our, our creative director of creative operations. And so, um, you know, the yin and yang there is fantastic with the synergies of the qualitative and the quantitative. But that's that's one aspect of many, many other things. And to, you know, and like, I gotta say, like, just talking to David and Mike, like, I'm so impressed with, with both of you guys as acumen and so smart and, and these guys hit, 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 hit every nail, you know, on, on all its heads with big picture and highs and lows, but it's, you, you know, it's time, money and effort and, and cash. And, you know, we'd love to have 27 more people to help us do this, but, you know, we all have to wear many, many hats. And I think kind of the vision quest is us is there is a, you know, there is a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow. Um, and that's, that's, that's part of the incentive is, is an, on top of our mission, which is, you know, to provide better men and change people's lives, help them live healthier um, lives and be better versions of themselves. But there's real world and kind of the, the alveola, as we say in Italian. I'll just add a, a quick thing because they both kind of nailed it. Um, one of the things that I think about a lot when looking for help is either find it within your community that you already have, like just ask. And even if you don't know the people, like you'd be surprised what people are willing to tell you um, just by asking. It, it's surprising sometimes. So don't feel like you can't ask someone that's way out of your league or something about a, a question that you have. You'll be shocked sometimes what you'll get back. Um, another thing that we think about a lot with when you're looking to cut through the noise is who is out there doing weird things, different things. And a lot of times it's the people that don't have as much experience. It's not the ones that have a decade plus 15 plus it's the ones that have just started getting into it because they're looking at things through a different lens. Uh, so a lot of times take in that advice to learn from the, the kids these days of what they're doing on TikTok and other things, because um, it's the future of DTC and it's where it's heading faster than we all would like to think. Um, so don't be afraid to take some advice from people that are much, much 
younger than us and, and just getting into the game because uh, they're, they're the ones that are developing it actually. I agree with all of that. And I would add slight bias here, try to outsource the things that you can outsource um, so that it leaves more brain space basically for you to think about the things that are really unique to your brand, um, whether that's product or getting creative with marketing and sales, um, whether that's on the, the finance side, on bookkeeping or HR or operations, um, anything that you can sort of offload, especially early on um, building any type of company, I would say is, is beneficial to you as the, the owner or the founder. Um, related question, um, who do you guys think would be the best first marketing hire if someone were to bring on, um, you know, just in terms of skill set, who would you look for? So Mike, I was hearing more of a generalist um, to, you know, and, and then in the interest of what I just said, maybe agencies, how do you guys think about extending just the bandwidth you have for marketing in terms of who you work with and who you hire? Um, I'll, I'll, t I'll take a, take a stab at that. Um, our first hire is a guy by the name of JW Crump and he's director of creative operations, and, but he is, he's so smart and he has experience previously at, at Microsoft, um, working with, and this is why I wanted to jump in on, on working with influencers on top of all the other things you do with marketing, but he understands the qualitative, he understands the quantitative, but Right, we're 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 front facing. Whether we're we're doing candles, sunscreen, or you know a, a piece of fitness equipment, is it's a multi pronged approach, and you need someone that understands the influencer game, that understands the back end Facebook, Instagram analytics, and and how that runs, and who, you know what needs to to happen to go into working with our our marketing team, uh, BBK in Milwaukee. Um, that then also gets how to work with our, our Clavio consultant because Clavio, I feel like is changing every day a and is personable and can, can help negotiate the contracts with the influencers yet can also do the back end, um, um, account, you know, bookkeeping and accounting to make sure that they're paid on, you know, that they're paid on time, the, the, the one-off, you know, person that we have helping to promote, cross promote the product. So fantastic, fantastic person. And to find him, you know, um, took time, but it, it was a natural fit. So hopefully that I answered that question, but I, it's just, I'm so passionate about it because it's, he's been so great, but and we're really fortunate to have him. Perfect. And then we have three more questions. Um, so I'll bundle two more because they're marketing related and then we'll tackle the last one about fulfillment last time. Um, so two questions. One is around how did you build? I think they're both around um, just like the very first steps you take with paid or social or building an email list. So the very first steps you take and um, building an email list. And then the other question is, is social media or paid social media still relevant and profitable? Um, I would say, you know, starting out very small is what I'm hearing from you guys experimenting, but is there anything that you would add to going from basically zero to that very first person, second person, third person in your email list or ad or you know response from an ad or anything like that? Well, on the email list, the first one is mom, right? <laughs> um, but, <Always. laughs> but like friends and family. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it's a pretty much a no brainer to offer a discount code in exchange for an email address, um, you know, especially at the early stages, especially if you're really focused on growth. Um, so that's a quick way to, to start growing your list. Um, and then to have a high converting website, uh, when people get their confirmation email on a sale that turns into an email address, you add to your file too. But, for, uh, but in all seriousness, like friends and family, um, is, is those are going to be the biggest brand advocates at the beginning. Um, and, and they'll come up big for you and it'll actually, it'll feel really, really good when they do. I'll second uh, what Mike has mentioned, um, but I'll also say look to outside ways to bring in new emails. And it's not that you're going to get emails from other brands, but if you do giveaways with other brands and you do things like that, you're going to get reach. And then those people find your website, they sign up for an email. Um, so it's kind of just figuring out how you're going to get new eyeballs. It's maybe not as expensive as just buying ads. Um, and there's a lot you can do just within different giveaways, different social stuff. Um, so look, look elsewhere instead of always thinking like, I'm gonna drive traffic with the ads because you're right, they are very expensive these days. And are they still relevant? 
I believe so if you're doing them, you know, what the new way is, which is a lot of more of the user generated content style ads, more engagement. Um, it's tough to just throw up a static picture and think you're going to win the, the Facebook Instagram game. So I would just be trying to think of different ways to find those eyeballs than just instantly shelling out dollars these days. Right. Okay, awesome. Um, and then last question, and then we can wrap it up. Um, and anyone who wants to take this one, did you consider self-fulfillment at the start of your business? What are the pros and cons of doing this versus going straight to a 3PL at the start? Can you ask that one more time, sir? What are the... It was... Totally. Yeah, pros and cons of um, doing fulfillment yourself when you start out or working with a 3PL. And, and I think, again, I can add some thoughts at the end of this, but curious what you guys thought from your perspectives. I, I mean, the first 1,000 labels I processed for Bird, and we fulfilled out of um, our partner, investor and partner, Ultra Slide, out of, out of Chicago, Barry Slide, and president, founder, and Barry himself shipped the burn boards to those first a thousand customers and it was you know while we were still proof of concepting the american made board and we we knew we needed the, the 3pl um an investor recommended us to airhouse and that was the best call um i had ever made and it was it's been seamless getting everything set up but um you know it, it logistically it's it's it, it's time money and effort and it you know, I recommend Shopify where Airhouse integrates like seamlessly into, into the system. And the team has been fantastic working with, you know, people like me who have no background in, in logistics. And so just the it's 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 chemistry, it's synergy, and it's and it's hustle. But um, you know, it's I definitely recommend using a 3PL. It's the best because you don't have to process the labels anymore. I mean, I, I, I considered it, it was recommended by someone too, as a way to, you know, just keep things scrappy. Um, I also didn't want to put 10,000 units of sunscreen in my New York apartment. Um, but I did one night stay up until like 4am after a long day of work, packing boxes before we were set up for fulfillment to send to editors uh, so they could sample the product. And that was a terrible night. Um, and I, I, I think it's, it's not really typically worth a founder's time to be packing and shipping boxes when, you know, a solution like Airhouse exists. Um, now I, I, I don't think that that's true of other 3PLs. Airhouse is a really good 3PL. Um, but you know, I would use a 3PL. We actually did some self-fulfillment early on but it was around the idea of learning more about the customers as well as how our product uh, was going to ship because it was such a weird concept to have these bags. We still weren't positive. It wasn't like just tossing something plastic in a box and shipping it out. Um, the candles were something where it had to be uh, looked at a little bit strongly. And for us, we did just the first month. It was just to try to figure out, okay, how do we best package these? How do we, when the customer opens it, what are they going to get? How are they going to see it? And uh, for those first few hundred customers, it was awesome just from a learning experience, but by no means is it worth the time. It is definitely not worth the founder's time to be doing it. But if you're learning your product, you're learning about your customers where it's sending. And also you can add in some really fun little notes to those early customers when you're trying to learn something from them. So there are definitely positives to self-fulfilling in the early days, but look at it as a learning experience and, and definitely collect that data and figure out how you can use it moving forward. But it is not something where it should probably be a long-term solution for anyone. Right. And I will add, I think that certain product types, one thing that helps when you go to outsource, um, I talk a lot about sort of warehouse readiness. Um, and so depending on, you know, how your packaging looks, how your product's going to arrive at the warehouse, um, some companies will also self-fulfill and so they sort of work out, you know, how is this gonna arrive at the warehouse? How are we going to make this a little bit more automated? Um, just because it can be a little bit looser depending on your product early days. And then certain products, I think I mentioned, are, are better, like they're better for fulfilling yourself and better for, for outsourcing. So basically the more complicated um, I think the product is. So if there's anything that's like made to order or if you want to early days 
um, add that special touch. Um, definitely better to do yourself if you if you can, like take a small piece um, of your inventory, a small set of your inventory, and just keep it if you wanted to do that. Um, and then do the high volume, the, the automated bid with the warehouse. But yeah, also when you go through the, the process of selling, or I'm sorry, the, of shopping for a warehouse, um, really make sure you ask a lot of questions around reliability, around how quickly they ship orders out. I think to go back to what someone said earlier about just really not making any assumptions um, around sort of the, what you're getting in a solution. So those would be my recommendations. And I think that's time. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, Johnny, Mike, David, for, for chatting with us. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. So much. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. And I actually just want to um, put up this screen real quick so that um, our audience knows where to find you guys. Really appreciate you guys sharing all your wonderful expertise and learning more about your brands. I'm so excited to watch you guys as you continue to grow. Um, so thank you so, so much guys. And then for our community, um, we have a couple of really awesome events coming up on September 8th. We have another power hour with Ada support. We'll be talking about, um, you know, customer service and the customer's, uh, journey with your brand. And then September 23rd, we have our future at beauty and wellness summit and November 18th, we have our discovery show at home. And both of those events will feature really future minded brands that are um, innovating within the industry, and then really great conversations on tactics for building your own business. So um, thank you guys again. Um, enjoy the rest of your week and we will see you soon. Thanks. Thank you.